And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. David Brumman joined the Washington, D.C. office of DLA Piper after serving eight years as Senior Sanctions Advisor of Insurance in the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the U.S. Treasury Department. In that role, David assisted in the development of compliance policy for the insurance industry, provided subject matter expertise on insurance to the Office of Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, assisted in drafting of licenses for insurance transactions, and developed recommendations for an appropriate OFAC response to sanctions violations within the insurance sector. Adam Smith is the Senior Advisor to the Director of the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, which plays the lead role in the implementation and enforcement of United States sanctions programs. As Senior Advisor, Adam has been involved in all aspects of OFAC's work, including the design and implementation of Russia and Iran sanctions, reform efforts at the United Nations, and the use of OFAC powers to hinder human rights abusers, organized crime, and narcotics traffickers. And now I'd like to turn the program over to our speakers. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and morning, everyone. Uh, we're glad to be with you today and have uh, about an hour and a half to talk about sanctions. Um, um, it's been a real challenge to think about how can we capsulize uh, 200 years of history and an entire complex uh, foreign policy tool in the segment of time that we're given. And we've tried to, uh, to do that in the best way we can. So we hope that um, how we've uh, designed this is a way to to give you both the high points and essentially some of the very nuanced uh, provisions of sanctions. And uh, um, uh, we're hoping that we can accomplish that uh, uh, today. So in order to condense this into a time frame, we, we decided to um, divide our presentation into three modules. Um, first, we're going to try and give a little background and history to sanctions to give you some context of where sanctions have come from and what they're about. And then we thought we would talk about the types of sanctions uh, generally that are available in the uh, foreign policy uh, uh, arena. Um, essentially, if we could uh, uh, put them into categories, there are three types of sanctions. There are what we call primary sanctions that essentially apply to U.S. persons and have been traditionally what has been the tool for dealing with uh, embargoes and actually using the sanctions tool. There are newer sanctions that have evolved in the more recent times of secondary sanctions that have application beyond just the U.S. persons. And then more recently, a, another level of sophistication of sanctions uh, called sectoral sanctions and the best example of that is what we see in Russia. And we're going to give you uh, an explanation of uh, the essential elements of the sanctions in those three programs, uh, Cuba, Iran, and Russia, to give you a flavor of the type of sanctions that are um, uh, out there and used by the government. And finally, we would like to talk a little bit about the OFAC enforcement process. And what is it that the agency does in its role as enforcing sanctions and what you can expect as a subject person or entity who is in some way affected and impacted by the prohibitions and the requirements of sanctions. That's our objective, and we hope that we can bring this uh, material to you in a way that uh, at the end of the day you're going to feel like you've got a better understanding of sanctions. And David, hi. So this, is, this is Adam. This is Adam speaking. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, just to, just so you know, so David obviously comes from the the private sector side, even though he obviously is a former colleague of ours at OFAC, and I come from the public sector side. So that was the other part of the the challenge we had is we wanted to split uh, split the baby down the middle in some respects and give you both perspectives, uh, sort of how how we should be thinking about this in the private sector, and maybe I can share a little bit about how we think about it from within the government. And so that's that's the the goal of the exercise, and hopefully we can be successful. Sorry, David, go for it. No, thank you. Um, the best way to give a, a snapshot of sanctions is to look at the timeline of when sanctions have been uh, uh, used. And uh, 
we can trace the origins of sanctions back to the um, early 19th century with the Embargo Act of 1807, and then throughout uh, 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 the time period of U.S. history, sanctions have been a, a part of the uh, uh, foreign policy of the United States, and as you can see, um, associated oftentimes, more often than not, in the context of, of hostilities. Uh, um, in the case of the Embargo Act, it was an effort to uh, influence the behavior of Great Britain in imprisoning U.S. sailors by restricting trade with Great Britain, and it proved not to be terribly successful because you all know about the War of 1812, and it's an example of how oftentimes sanctions is an alternative to hostilities and used as something to be, uh, uh, to, to avoid uh, another other level of, uh, 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 of, of activity um, from a foreign policy uh, standpoint. Um, most of the uh, other instances that we have here is that trading with the Enemy Act in the Civil War and with World War I, was, it was a complement to the hostilities prohibiting uh, trade with the, with the enemies. And in World War II, sanctions were used to block and keep the Nazi regime from accessing the accounts of some of the Eastern European countries and, and, and uh, individuals. And then uh, in uh, uh, the early part of the, of the 50s, uh, they were a complement to the actions that were uh, uh, hostilities in Korea and, and China. And in 1963, sanctions were part of the response to the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were the first uh, 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 type of reaction, and they uh, avoided uh, hostilities. And then in 1977, it was determined that there's a need to have a broader authority for sanctions in non-wartime context, and so there was a statute passed that essentially granted a broader authority to the president to use sanctions in a peacetime context, and in that case it involved our response to the Iranian hostage crisis. That's an overview of, uh, of how sanctions ha have evolved, and I guess if there was a... Um, um, uh, Something to condense from all of that, I think that the, the, the two essential points or the fundamental feature, features of, of sanctions that, that need to be emphasized, if, if you can look at all that and try and look to see what are sanctions about, there's two primary fundamental features that I think are important. One is that sanctions are a tool of foreign policy. And to the extent foreign policy is challenged and complex, so too are sanctions, and they're to be seen uh, always in the context of what is the objective of the foreign policy in that context. And secondly, transactions uh, or uh, sanctions are transactional in nature, and they apply transactionally. And by this I mean they're not relational. So it isn't like we have an enemy or like a terrorist state in some cases. That's not the case. They're transactions because they're economic in their base, and, they, and they're centered on specific aspects of an economic transaction. And so it's important to, to recognize that, that sanctions require, you know, exact transactional components in order to be uh, uh, applicable. In analyzing a particular matter in determining how sanctions exist, and as Adam mentioned, you know, I'm now in the private sector, and people come and they want to know, is this sanctions, or is this something that sanctions uh, I need to be concerned about? I, over, over the course of the time that I've been involved with sanctions, I've come to uh, essentially boil the sanctions questions down to a trilogy of three components, three analytical components. The first is, who is the subject person? Who is, the, uh, 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 who is involved in the matter that is subject to the sanctions? Uh, secondly, what is the transaction? What is the type of activity that is being engaged in, and does it fall within anything that the sanctions prohibit? And third, who is the target of what is the sanctions uh, restrictions, and are they involved in the transaction, and are they connected to the subject person? And if you analyze each of those elements in all of the sanctions programs, and it turns out that the sanctions programs all have different um, degrees of detail for each of those, 
and as a result, uh, you need to sometimes spend more time in one part or one other part, but at the end of the day, these are the three components of a sanctions analysis. In looking over how sanctions have been used in, in the history, I've also condensed what I like to present to uh, audiences like this, kind of some guiding principles or historical lessons that we have learned that are very important today. And, and the first of these is that language in the sanctions uh, um, authority is imprecise. Um, it's because it's drafted by legislative and, and, and policymakers, and it's not something that is always familiar with how the business is conducted. And in order to drive that point home, I want to I, I use a quote from Albert Gallatin, the first treasurer of the United States. He wrote to Congress in 1807 about the Embargo Act. He said the following, the want of precision in describing the prohibited articles in the Non-Importation Act will give rise to much perplexity and numerous suits before the construction of the statute can be definitively settled. 1807, the treasurer of the United States has some problems with what the meaning was in the Embargo Act in terms of what was being dealt with. Second principle for uh, historical uh, learning is that the policy that is being articulated and, and, and promoted in the sanctions overrides commercial interest. And the short form of that is policy trumps profits. Another historical uh, uh, event that uh, occurs I like to uh, use to, to teach this is later on in implementing the Embargo Act in, in 1808, uh, John Adams was a legislator from Massachusetts and was ahead of the committee in Congress that was implementing the act. And he had received from his Bostonian constituents a letter. and was asked if he could essentially give them some relief on some of the prohibitions that were involved in the Embargo Act. In the letter, um, and, and he wrote back and essentially said the following. The petitioners represent that they have on hand a large quantity of dry and pickled fish, which, unless exported before the summer heats, will be liable to p perish. The committee perceive and regret the extraordinary pressure with which this import important national measure must operate on those citizens who hold perishable articles. As both houses of Congress have manifested the determination of adhering to the general policy of the embargo for the present, the committee do not perceive any admissible principle on which the prayer can be granted. And so one of our early license applications in 1808 was a denial, even though it involved <laughs> significant losses. And the final historical principle that I think we've seen, and this is in more recent years, is as time has gone on, sanctions has become more sophisticated, more detailed, more targeted, and, and, and better adapted to the specifics of the uh, transactions and the economic uh, uh, environment in which they function. And, and in fact, I mean, this is, this is Adam again. In fact, if you think about the the primary, secondary, sectoral uh, trilogy, to use that term again, um, it, it, that, that that was sort of what we did first, second, and more recently. And those are increasingly uh, targeted, increasingly limited, and increasingly uh, detailed versions of prohibitions. And so with that, that that sort of matches over time what David said uh, is sort of one of the big historical lessons of the sophistication. And so now. As Adam had mentioned, and we, we had uh, indicated before, that we've kind of divided, for purposes of, of helping you get, get your arms around uh, all of the complexities here, three categories of sanctions. And they're exactly, uh, as Adam said, more historical in their evolution uh, from a standpoint of primary sanctions being essentially the earlier and, and, and more you know, basic form of sanctions, secondary sanctions, and then uh, uh, sectoral sanctions. And what we thought we would do is give you an example of the primary sanctions and the secondary and, and the sectoral and see how they actually operate to give you a flavor for the differences and also some details of the programs in which they operate. And so our first example and to give you a little more flavor for what primary sanctions are, we're going to look to the Cuba program. Um, 
which were uh, originated in the early 60s to address the response to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so the, uh, the, the essential elements of the Cuba uh, sanctions as primary sanctions are that the subject persons in the Cuba sanctions and, and primary sanctions are U.S. persons. And U.S. persons are defined as individuals and entities uh, uh, located in the United States, citizens of the United States, or entities organized under the laws of the United States. And in the particular case of the Cuba program and, and then recently the uh, Iran program, they also include affiliates and subsidiaries of corporations that are uh, domiciled in the United States. They are the subject persons. The transactions are defined by program, and there are there are two basic types of sanctions programs from the pri in the primary area. One is programs based on the uh, Trading with the Enemy Act that we had, had mentioned earlier, and they deal with essentially prohibitions on dealing with property of a targeted country or targeted entity, dealing in property. And the second type of transactional prohibitions are more in the later type of uh, statute, the IEPA, uh, uh, International Emergency Economic Powers Act, and the, and the uh, orders that have come down on that. And the primary sanctions that apply to U.S. persons deal with essentially the exportation, sale, supply, directly or indirectly, of goods, technology, or services. And these are the two schemes of types of prohibitions that apply to the transactions. And in each instance, they apply to a targeted country like Cuba or Iran, or what we call specially designated nationals, individuals that for whatever reasons have been determined to be essentially enemies of the United States, and be they you know, kingpin drug dealers, uh, terrorists, uh, dealers in weapons of mass destruction. Um, there are individuals who are des and entities who are designated as particular conduct that has been engaged in that is a, uh, a problem uh, for the United States. And, and so if you were to look at the, if you look at the list of, uh, of, of actual entities that are sanctioned uh, on our specially designated national list, the 6,000 odd entity list that is kept by the Treasury Department, the vast, vast majority of people on that list are not people who are there solely because they are Cuban or solely because they're Iranian or, or solely because they are geographically associated with a regime that the United States does or doesn't like. Rather, the vast majority of people on those lists are, are the SDNs themselves, are the particular people whose behaviors, whose narcotic trafficking, whose WMD trafficking, whose engage in, engagement in terrorism, that is why they're on the list. So over time, even the primary sanction uh, has become more and more focused away from sort of the regime based basis, um, which you see still, admittedly, in the Cuba and Iran case, the DPRK case as well, and more and more to the highly targeted, non-regime related at all, but behavior related sanction when it comes to dealing with narcotics traffickers and WMD traffickers and others. Now let's drill down a little deeper to Cuba sanctions as a primary example of the primary sanctions and look to see what it is that is comprising the, the, the primary sanction. And uh, in looking at uh, uh, Cuba, we look to see that it's, it's the oldest uh, sanctions uh, uh, regime uh, that we have as an active sanctions program today, and its original authority was the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 that was the statute that was the basis for the executive order in the uh, uh, early 1960s on prohibiting trade and excluding all types of dealings with the property of, of Cubans. Subsequent statutes have reinforced that over time, uh, the Cuba Democracy Act and the uh, Libertad Act of 1992, and essentially um, they've all come and over the time of these uh, four or five decades have been codified or crystallized in the regulations of the Cuban Asset Control Regulations. They're very extensive, very detailed, and they essentially deal with uh, prohibitions on dealing with property in which Cuba has an interest. The two most critical uh, provisions of Cuba sanctions that stick out as primary sanctions um, uh, are the the breadth of the prohibitions uh, dealing with with, uh, with property restrictions. And, and here's the language uh, right out of the, uh, the the regs 
no U.S. person can deal with transactions involving property in which Cuba has at any time had any interest of any nature whatsoever, direct or indirect. And just as an aside, in dealing in some of the context of this in insurance, I've always had some problems with the extent to which, and I've come, come to accept the fact that this is not legal language, it's, it's more metaphysical. It's very broad. It can be used as broadly as what a court or an agency would like it to be. And the second element of the Cuban sanctions that makes them um, kind of stick out from the others is the use of the tool of defining the breadth of a U.S. person to be an affiliate or a subsidiary of a foreign of a U.S. corporation, and this is very extensive and runs into many uh, commercial problems and issues when the basis for a transaction may have nothing to do with the United States if it's a subsidiary or foreign uh, uh, company, but yet if they're owned or controlled by a U.S., they're brought within the scope of the Cuba sanctions. And, and, and you also then run into serious. Um, uh, um, legal issues in other countries that have either have don't have sanctions on Cuba, which are which are most countries, or have prohibitions to actually uh, prohibitions for their own people to comply with foreign sanctions, uh, and so that that's a huge problem that people run into primarily in Europe, but also in, in other country in other parts of the world as well, because of the breadth of the of the program. And many of you have been reading the papers and seeing the news and. Um, watching how we've revised uh, this Cuba sanctions policy in the last couple weeks. And it's been a significant uh, a development. But I'm going to let my colleague from the Treasury Department talk about what are some of the things that have been done by the administration to essentially lighten the, the sanctions uh, prohibitions in Cuba. Adam? Thank you. Thank you, David. That, that's right. I mean, if there's been one, um, well, <laughs> there have been many sanctioned stories, I guess, in the past uh, uh, several months, everything from what we're seeing with the Iranian negotiations to continued problems uh, in Ukraine uh, to, of course, Cuba. Cuba is perhaps the one that um, has, has garnered the greatest amount of support. Uh, there have been many people who have thought that it's long overdue, um, and the president decided uh, of his own volition to move to lessen the burden uh, of sanctions, and I think that that's the correct term to use, because what I can tell you explicitly is that the sanctions remain in large measure, the embargo remains in large measure, um, but what has been removed are some of the um, the difficulties with complying with the embargo, and it means that some of the exceptions that were already in place uh, on a what we call a specific basis, in other words, a case-by-case -case ad hoc basis, have now become generalized. Uh, and so what that means, it really is a burden question. So there have been several uh, ways that one could, as a U.S. person, legally uh, travel to Cuba. And that has been in place now for several years. Uh, but in order to do so, you needed to go through a, a rather, not difficult process, but certainly time-consuming process of applying to my agency, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and making it very clear in a license application uh, what it is that you wanted to do and why it is that this should be an exemption uh, to, um, to an otherwise broad prohibition that David uh, described it. Uh, what's become the, the law now, as of last Friday, actually, is that many of the um, the categories that were broadly receiving these exceptions on an ad hoc basis, on a one-off license basis, have now become generalized, uh, which means that people can basically take advantage of the um, their ability to travel or even engage in some commerce with Cuba without resort to my agency, meaning that you do no, you no longer, so long as you are, you fit into one of the categories of the exceptions, uh, that you are now generally licensed. And that basically means that it is an exception that is broadly or generally applicable. You don't need to come into us to sort of deal with that. So there have been a couple. Uh, um, let me go through here. So travel is one of the big ones. And in fact, if you wanted to think about the way that C the Cuba sanctions have been sort of changed, this is the most important one, I would think, or at least one of the, the largest categories. It basically makes the prohibition on travel um, much more limited. So it is still illegal as a U.S. person to travel to Cuba uh, on a beach holiday or broadly uh, just broad touristic endeavors. Again, you have to think about the sanctions as a part of foreign policy. 
And the foreign policy here is that the president wants to engage, wants the U.S. U.S. people to engage with the Cuban people in a way that hopefully will open up Cuba, hopefully um, change the, the fortunes of people in Cuba, uh, and maybe even one day uh, even change the government of Cuba to a more uh, to, 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 to a more open uh, human rights protecting uh, administration. That's the goal of the exercise. Uh, the thought was that opening up travel to sort of the average beachgoer uh, that could go to Havana or Santiago or what have you uh, was not the goal here. Rather, there are specific categories of travel, 12 of them actually, um, which go to the president's a fundamental foreign policy objectives um, and make it very easy now for American citizens who fit into those categories to, uh, to to travel to Cuba without again without resort to coming to into the Treasury Department for an up or down vote as to whether or not they can um, they, they can uh, they can use the exception. Now I, I'll go through very briefly what some of the exceptions are. Um, but I, I urge you to go to the OFAC website. They, there's a very, very good frequently asked question that was published just last week, in fact, a week ago today. Um, there's, of course, uh, it's also where you can get more information on the Cuban asset control regulations, what still is prohibited, what, still, um, what, what you still can't do, and, of course, now the things that you can do. Um, some of the... Um, some of them are, are significant. So as I said, travel by U.S. persons, travel services for travel to Cuba, that's, a, that's travel agents um, are allowed to sort of now, again, without coming, to the, uh, coming into Treasury, are allowed to sell trips to Cuba so long as they, the trips, um, the, the members of the, tra of the traveling party all fit into one or more of the, of the categories for the general license. And the categories, just to give you a, a, a flavor, it, they're very, very broad. Um, and so that includes family visits, official business of the U.S. government, or foreign governments for that matter, journalistic activity, professional research, educational activities, religious activities, um, athletic competitions, support for the Cuban people, which of course is a very broad category, humanitarian projects, um, activities of private foundations or research or educational institutions. Uh, I mean, as you can tell, it, it's a very, very broad category. Um, it doesn't, again, it does not mean that everything qualifies, and there are certain exceptions. So, for instance, one of the things that we make it very, very clear is that if you are traveling in a group and uh, to Cuba, and one member of that group uh, qualifies under one of these 12 categories for a general license, that does not necessarily mean that every other member can simply live under that person's, um, uh, in, under the umbrella of that, uh, of that coverage. In other words, every member of the group has to fit into one of the 12 categories in order to receive that exception. That's a pretty important, um, important sort of component. But as I mentioned, the breadth of the exceptions are such that I would imagine more and more people are going to be able to find themselves into one or more of the categories. But this broad tourism is still, uh, still prohibited. Um, in fact, one of the interesting exceptions to professional visits. So now you can actually go to a professional meeting in Cuba on a general license perspective. However, the goal of that meeting um, cannot be to promote tourism in Cuba. So in other words, no matter, no matter what uh, other exceptions you're allowed to sort of fit under, there's the broad foreign policy goal of, again, not fully opening um, frankly, the wallets of American citizens to Cuba, that that's just not the goal of this exercise at this stage. It may well be uh, in the future, certainly if Congress has, decides to act to sort of remove the embargo. Um, but as of now, we're, we're, in a, we're in a position where we have significantly rolled back some of the, the measures, um, but we've rolled them back as exceptions to otherwise prohibited activities rather than rolling back the embargo or, frankly, even all of the sanctions themselves. Um, one of the other important changes um, is to do the remittances to Cuba, uh, basically changing the amount that can be provided, uh, which is, again, it's talking about the ability for individuals, family members to to sort of continue to sort of their engagement, because the idea that the president has is that the more we engage, the more we're able to sort of uh, open Cuba up in that regard, the, the better it is going to be for our foreign policy, of course, but even more for uh, our ability to sort of to, to gain the ends we would like uh, in, in the relationship. And a key to that, of course, is the, the, the tens of hundreds of thousands of Cubans uh, that, that, that are in the United States that still have strong ties uh, back, and back to the island. And so the president realized that opening up travel and the ability to communicate remittances of financial communication uh, is even greater. It's a significant, of, of significant importance in order to get the result that we would like here.
So financial transactions involving Cuba, I mean, as David mentioned, I mean, it has been very much off, off, the, off the table. Um, but now there have been some, because of this, the ability, again, for remittances to flow, there's significantly greater uh, amount of remittances that can now flow on a sort of a, on a quarterly basis. Um, U.S. banks will be able to open up correspondent accounts in Cuba at Cuban banks, uh, which is a very, very, um, uh, that, that's the start of real financial transactions. For those on the line who know how banking works, I think you can recognize how important having a correspondent account uh, will be to sort of encourage and, and, and sort of enable the, the trade and the commerce that, that may well uh, uh, you know, come to flow sort of in, in the near term. Um, Telecommunications and Internet services are another very important uh, addition. In fact, that's one of the, the very broad, so outside the travel allowance that I mentioned of the 12 categories, the telecom area is one that is incredibly broad and may have the largest impact on a dollar basis. Because what the allowance has now done is basically allowing uh, telecom providers in the United States to establish the necessary mechanisms and infrastructure to provide commercial telecommunications Internet services. Um, in Cuba, and that's in Cuba, within Cuba, and between Cuba and third countries, not just the United States. So as you can imagine, that's a potentially very, very significant amount of investment uh, that is needed in Cuba, obviously, because of the it's, it's a fairly derelict uh, telecom system th thus far, um, and the U.S. persons, uh, telecoms and otherwise, and service providers, uh, and those who travel with them. I mean, you can imagine that there's a, a large sort of concentric circles that sort of grow around from the telecom provider it, uh, itself to the consultants to uh, those who provide service to the telecom provider, all of whose services, um, as, long, as long as they are obviously linked appropriately, um, are now going to be allowed under this general license. So that's a very, very significant, um, significant change. Additionally, uh, as, as, as David made very clear, one of the other things that was so interesting about the Cuba sanctions is how it dealt with Cubans, not just Cuba. Uh, and so Cubans outside Cuba uh, were also off limits to U.S. persons in very interesting ways uh, that, again, is unique in the, in the annals of our sanctions programs. And again, what our allow, what, so in other words, if you were a Cuban um, citizen and you were in you know, another country, not the United States and not Cuba, trying to engage with a U.S. person, uh, a hotel or a bank or even just an individual on a, for a transaction, it was often hard, if not impossible, to do that. Um, but again, what, what the... Uh, what these new regulations allow, again, the prohibition as a legal matter remains, but what, we, we, what these allowances now is there's now an exemption. There's now this generalized exemptions for Cubans who are ordinarily resident in other countries to engage in, in frankly, normal commerce and normal trade with U.S. banks or U.S. persons. Uh, but again, I, I urge you very, very strongly, if you're interested in the Cuba, what's going on in the Cuba system, uh, the uh, sanction system, to look at the OPAC website. Um, and to really familiarize yourself with the, the Cuba asset control regulations, because you'll see the, it's still rather significant. And so these exceptions are important, and the president mentioned them in the State of the Union. And of course, they've received, I think, their due amount of press. Um, and of course, the negotiations to actually normalize relations, um, open up embassies or whatnot, are ongoing uh, yesterday and today in Havana, first very high-level uh, meetings between the two countries in almost 40 years. So things are moving, and, and the, the sanctions may well change again and that's one thing we, we didn't mention at the, at the outset and one of the other big challenges about talking to sanctions uh, talking about sanctions is that because they are uh, responsive to foreign policy um, they are responsive to to the, the winds of change uh, that are out of our control very often uh, and so they they change and they um, they are altered in important in large ways like you see in the Cuba situation um, but often in small ways that may be important in certain co contexts uh, not on a day-to-day -day basis but certainly on a frequent basis and so I can we can tell you today uh, uh, sitting here um, that at the, you know, on the 22nd of January at about 2.40 Eastern, uh, this is what sanctions look like on Cuba um, or Iran or Russia, which we'll get into uh, in, in a moment. Um, but we can't necessarily tell you that this is what they'll look like next week, next month, or in, in, you know, next year is a completely different ballgame altogether. So that's, that's where we are in Cuba. Um, and we're starting to get, as you can imagine, interesting questions um, about the, what the regulations mean and how they apply and what the, what the exemptions mean. Uh, and the other beauty of going to the OFAC website is that you can you sort of keep, keep up with the conversation, because what we do publish are frequently asked questions. And we have a whole bunch that are already on, as I mentioned, uh, already on the site. And uh, we have uh, 45 of them uh, that have already been on. 
what we usually do is that as practitioners run into difficulties of interpretation, as David said, a lot of the regulations are written in, in not necessarily legalese, but policy ease, um, that don't necessarily respond directly to the realities on the ground for commercial players or even just individuals. What happens is we often get these questions that are very commonly asked, and then we decide to sort of provide a formal guidance document and usually incorporate that in the frequently asked questions. And so that's what I recommend you sort of do, uh, just so you can stay, again, keep up with that conversation. David, before I go on to talk about Iran and secondary sanctions, is there anything you wanted to add on, on Cuba? Uh, only to emphasize this uh, somewhat uh, difficult distinction maybe between tourism and going on the various other uh, uh, types of uh, uh, travel, that that was kind of a policy decision that tourism enhanced the economy and helped the Cuban government and um, the other types of travel were aimed at uh, establishing relationships with people and trying to instill and impart the values of, uh, of U.S. travelers. And it's just an example of the complexities that come about when you try to implement foreign policy in a transactional setting. It may appear to be not very logical, but there is a basis upon which, now whether it's successful or not or whether it works or not is a different question, but there is a reason for it. So this yeah. is an example. That's right. I mean, the government of Cuba, the Cuban Communist Party, are still very much sanctioned entities. Uh, so David is exactly, is exactly right. What we're trying to do is basically go below them uh, and so engage with uh, – in fact, there's going to be – fairly soon the State Department is actually going to provide a list of actual Cuban entrepreneurs, private sector entrepreneurs with whom commerce can be engaged. Um, and so again, the whole idea is to sort of cut the, the government, the Communist Party, in some respects out from the, uh, the interpersonal exchanges that the President is trying to promote through this uh, policy change. So with that, that in mind, we'll go on to uh, Iran? yeah, let's move on to, let's move on to Iran. Um, so Iran, the slides are. Oops. Iran. The title here is secondary sanctions. Uh, but what's interesting about secondary sanctions in the Iran context, and I'll let you, David, to describe secondary sanctions in a second. Is is yep. we call it secondary sanctions, but in fact, as we mentioned, um, these are complex sanctions. In other words, they are additive in some respects. So as we'll get into, the Iranian sanctions are both primary and secondary. Uh, but Iran, I think, has, I think, rightfully become known for the impact of the secondary sanctions, which we can talk about in particular. Um, but anyway, just so you know, just because it's titled the secondary sanctions, it doesn't mean there are not primary sanctions on Iran. There are. <laughs> but secondary are, are perhaps the ones that I would argue really have been incredibly effective over the past uh, four to five years, maybe have been the cause for Iran to finally come to the negotiating table uh, to start talking about the nuclear program. Uh, but certainly it, it represented an inflection point uh, with how serious and how, um, how arduous the sanctions were for both Iran and, and those who were continuing to trade with Iran. With that, David, why don't you um, go over the next slide? Yeah, let me, let me try to explain. It's kind of difficult to get this across because we're going to now talk about Iran, and we talked about before primary sanctions in Cuba, and then I tried to introduce what this idea of secondary sanctions was, and now we're going to talk about Iran. And Adam makes a good point. If you think about this as building blocks, and the first building block was primary sanction, and it was, you know, the essential elements that we have. When we move to Iran, we still have all of that. We have primary sanctions in Iran, too, but over time what has happened is we've expanded that and it created a new sanctions category called secondary sanctions, and it so happens that it's primarily the context of Iran. It's not in Cuba, and, 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 and it's, in a, it's part of an evolution of more complexity and more expanded role. So everything that we talked about for primary sanctions, U.S. persons, transactions, and, and subject parties, applies in Iran as, as, as primary sanctions. However, in 1996, it was um, uh, uh, the Iran and Libya Sanctions Act was passed as an effort to address the problem that was being uh, confronted by U.S. policymakers with primary sanctions, and that is, if everybody is not doing the same thing you are in your prohibiting and restricting the economic activity of the target country, then they don't work too well. And so when the U.S., as a response to the Iranian hostage crisis, put 
primary sanctions on Iran and prohibited U.S. parties from providing any type of equipment that would develop the petroleum resources of Iran, that was great for U.S. Uh, uh, goods and services, but it didn't stop the Europeans from providing the same type of thing, and so they were uh, largely ineffective. So in 1996, Congress passed the Iran and Libya Sanctions Act that essentially addressed that problem by providing and establishing a new category of sanctions that applied to everyone, not to just U.S. persons. So secondary sanctions essentially apply to everybody who would be able to be engaging in the activity that's prohibited. We may ask, you know, well, how does that work? Well, think of it this way, that it's secondary sanctions because the prohibitions or the restrictions that apply to the target person who's engaging in the activity are not directly applied because there's no jurisdiction. But what happens in secondary sanctions, if you engage in the type of conduct like providing infrastructure to uh, uh, Iran, what's happened will be the U.S. will cut you off from access to the U.S. system. They will essentially keep you from the benefits of what would occur if you were trying to engage in, in commerce and be uh, 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 you as the U.S. So they're secondary in the sense that they don't apply directly to the persons that are engaging in the you know, undesirous conduct. They are what are imposed on that person as restricting U.S. persons from dealing with them. So the characteristic of secondary sanctions is that they're essentially applicable to anyone, anybody in, in, in the world, and yet, unlike the primary sanctions, it's very, they're very, very, very narrowly uh, constructed. And in the, in the uh, 1996 Act, it was only providing uh, equipment and development uh, uh, infrastructure for the Iranian petroleum extraction. That is broadly, has been broadened, but it, it, it's still relatively narrow. And with secondary sanctions, there's a knowledge requirement. It is that the person that's doing this, that's the non-U.S. person, has to knowingly engage in that, and there's a materiality requirement, which is another significant uh, 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 restriction in terms of the scope. And the targets of the secondary sanction are essentially the uh, country, the activity of the country uh, that's engaged in, or they can be uh, entities uh, that primarily are from that country. Um, the best example that I know is the uh, uh, ERISA, the, uh, the, the Iranian uh, uh, shipping lines, is a designated entity, and they would be prohibited uh, on a secondary sanctions. So that's the essential elements. And what the uh, just, 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 just for a second to give you an example, and we'll go through this in, in slightly greater detail in a second. So ERISA. So David. So if I am a uh, a British insurer, and I engage with ERISA, what consequences could I face in the United States? Well, the secondary sanctions would be uh, 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 layered over what you were doing and would essentially uh, uh, say if it was determined that you indeed did engage in conduct that was um, uh, prohibited by secondary sanctions or within the scope of secondary sanctions, and in this case dealing with a SDN uh, would be, then if you did it knowingly and you did it in a significant way, then what could happen would be the Secretary of State could put you uh, on notice that this is not uh, something that you're uh, uh, allowed or able to do, and if you don't stop it, we're going to restrict you from essentially being able to use any of the U.S. Uh, economy in your activities. And what does that mean? No U.S. dollar transactions, no bank accounts in the United States, no traveling of any of your employees to the United States, and we will essentially more or less blacklist you from being engaged in dealing with anything associated with the United States. What, what, it, what I mean, to put more, more pointedly, what it's, what it's posing for those who are neither the U.S. or Iran is a choice. The choice is you can deal with Iran, these certain entities in Iran, or you can deal with the United States. You can no longer do both. So secondary sanctions make it very clear that if you're a British insurer or a French, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're a third country actor engaging with one of these SDNs. You can no longer do that and engage with the United States. That's the choice that secondary sanctions provide. 
Now, there's been a lot of criticism. Well, there's been a lot of criticism of, uh, uh, of of secondary sanctions as being extraterritorial. Um, I guess one of the responses is that essentially uh, all the United States is doing is saying to its own citizens, you cannot deal with this identified uh, player that's engaged in this conduct, and it isn't really extending anything to that player. It's keeping them away from the U.S. I mean, that's right. I mean, when I've gone abroad to talk to uh, folks all around the world about the Iran sanctions especially, that's a very common complaint I've gotten, that these are secondary or extraterritorial in nature. But again, it's because the impact of it, basically what happens is when this choice happens, so if you are a you know, country in country X and you are an insurer or a bank or what have you, and you would decide to engage with a, an SDN or an actor that we don't like, what happens is that that bank in, the, in, in this other country, you know, the British bank that is engaged in, in the transaction, that itself doesn't actually get sanctioned. Right? We don't actually put them on our sanctions. They don't become an SDN themselves. Rather, what would happen is we would send a note out. These are just hypotheticals, of course. We would send a note out, official note, <laughs> to the banking and otherwise com and financial sector community in the United States, prohibiting them from doing any dealings with this entity. Um, so that's, what, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. So it's, it's not, nothing is actually being applied directly on uh, the, the foreign country entity. It's being applied all in the United States. That's a very important distinction. And what, frankly, the pushback I often give is that if you are a U.S. bank, and you want to open up a branch and name your country, uh, you've, got to fill, you've got to follow whatever regulations that country imposes on you. You know, capital to risk ratio, certain, uh, certain measures uh, for, 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 for soundness and, and security of a, of a financial institution, for instance. All we're saying is that if you want to engage in the, in the United States financial system, there are certain regulations we have as well, and they are very similar to some of those that you have in other countries, plus we have this additional one, is that not only do you have to be, have safety and security and, and uh, stability of a financial system if you're a bank, you also can no longer engage with entities that we find objectionable from the sanctions basis. Just another on our list that, again, we, we impose domestically, even though the activity is occurring, the suspect activity is occurring entirely outside the United States jurisdiction. So, Adam, uh, would you uh, talk a little bit about how we've had to essentially layer sanctions? We started out with primary, we've got secondary, and now we have this 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 pile of sanctions that involve Iran and it, uh, it is show crazy. Us a little bit how we got there. <laughs> so it, this, the Iranian sanctions um, program is uh, by far in a way um, the most complicated sanctions program uh, we have um, by a huge measure. We have uh, two dozen executive orders uh, that impose various sanctions. Some of them have overridden other executive orders, and we have. As you can see on the top there, the yellow boxes, these are pieces of legislation that also impose sanctions. So that's uh, six of them since just 1996. That's a huge amount uh, compared that to other sanctions programs. Most sanctions programs, just to give you a perspective, don't ha either have only one piece of legislation that, that are associated with them or none, and that the president is just using the standing authority that he has under the IEPA Act that, the, that, uh, that David mentioned earlier, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, using the standing authority that the Congress gave him back in 1977 to impose sanctions of his own volition in however way he, he chooses. What Congress is doing in Iran and has done increasingly uh, is basically say that you can do that, um, but you need to do also this and impose different sorts of sanctions. And so what you're seeing um, is that that's in more and more actually where secondary sanctions come from. And so if you go back, if you look at 1996, that, that line, just looking at the, the yellow boxes again, the Iran Sanctions Act, that was the initial secondary sanctions. Uh, going forward, the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act, that's SADA, that's uh, arguably the, the most impactful secondary sanctions uh, that were put in place. That was in July of 2010. And then NDAA, TRA, and IFCA, those last three, they did many different things, but one of the big things they did is they just expanded the scope of secondary sanctions. So whereas Sasada basically said that it, it applied to foreign banks, 
and says if you're a foreign bank engaging with a certain number of entities in Iran that we don't like, you can lose your access to the U.S. Uh, increasingly, it, it, increased, it increased the number of entities that was, that was both caught, both under both which entities um, outside Iran could lose their access to the U.S., banks, individuals, uh, corporations, and also what entities in Iran that you can't deal with if you want to maintain your access to the United States, increasing not just to the entities you know, who are SDNs, but people who are Central Bank of Iran or government of, or, or government of Iran more broadly. I mean, it, it increased the, the catchment significantly. So that's what we're dealing with. And in fact, this chart, if, if there's any chart that's sort of an important one so you can understand a little bit about the negotiations that are ongoing, one of the challenges that you can imagine we have is that in order to provide sanctions relief, which hopefully is the end goal if we can get an agreement that, 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 that meets the President's goals here, um, is to relieve some of these sanctions. But as you can tell, much like in the Cuba context, the top line here, above the line, is all congressional action. Below the line is all executive action. Executive action, the president can do tomorrow. Uh, but congressional action, he obviously can't. And so you're limited in some respects, given that the superstructure of sanctions now, both primary and secondary, is both legislative and executive. You're limited in your ability to roll back uh, sanctions in ways that you might want to uh, because there's a congressional overlay. And of course, the executive's job is to execute the law, and, they, and the, law, the law states X, Y, and you need to behave X, Y, and Z. Uh, so that's, that's one of the challenges. And this chart, I think, does a very good job at sort of explaining the complexity of, the, of where we, how we got to where we are uh, and the, the complexity of moving back from this, this, this position if, indeed, that is where we end up uh, with the negotiations. You want to talk a little bit about the joint plan of action and uh, what might be some of the ideas for where we're at then? I can. I was going to talk about JPO in a, in a moment, actually. I mean, there's a... Li I mean, depending on the questions I get, there is um, there's obviously very limited um, uh, insight I can provide as to what may or may not happen uh, at the negotiations, because everything is, is obviously up for negotiation, uh, what, the, uh, what the Iranians will be giving and what we will be giving, we meeting our in our, our EU and um, our EU plus uh, P5 plus one colleagues. Um, and so there's not much I can say. I can provide some details about what the sanctions relief that we've provided thus far looks like, and that's, I think, coming in a slide or two. Um, but uh, th that, that's sort of where we are right now. Uh, so if I, if I may just very, very briefly, as David mentioned, these are additive. And so the secondary sanctions we mentioned are on top of a very comprehensive list of primary sanctions. And so again, this is not as comprehensive or as uh, to <laughs> to uh, to uh, murder the punt as radioactive uh, as the Cuba sanctions, um, but they're they're close. They're they are embodied in our regulations uh, in the Iranian Transactions and Sanctions Regulations, the ITSER. <coughs> Pardon me. And they apply to U.S. persons and transactions, and they're, it's a very broad prohibition on imports and exports of goods, services, and technology to or from Iran directly or indirectly. There are exceptions uh, for food, agriculture, uh, medical devices, and whatnot, um, broad exceptions that are provided. Um, but as a general matter, it is essentially off limits for, for trade. Um, and what secondary things have done is it made it, it's made it off limits for trade for others as well. Uh, so that, that's how you can sort of look at the secondary sanctions in itself through a primary lens as well. So the secondary, sorry, went one too many slides. Sorry about this. Trying to get to the secondary. OK, so the secondary Maybe. sanctions, sorry about that. Um, a little bit of technical uh, problems on, on my end. So the secondary sanctions, as I said, go on top of the um, primary sanctions. One of the big challenges, and again, this is just so everyone sort of is aware of this, and those who are practitioners, longtime practitioners sort of get this, and those who are sort of new to the field may be surprised, shocked, confused, nauseated, depending <laughs> on, the, on this. The secondary sanctions, there are two sorts of secondary sanctions. They're the ones that David mentioned that were done in the, in the Iran uh, Libya Sanctions Act in the mid-90s, um, which are done primarily, not entirely, but primarily are, are, are orchestrated, administered, and enforced by the State Department. Um, those are the ones that are primarily energy-related. 
The secondary sanctions that were passed in 2010 under the CISADA Act I mentioned are the Treasury-administered ones. As you can imagine, there's, there's obviously a lot of coordination and cooperation in the interagency between state and Treasury when we're talking about sanctions. Uh, that, that, that should go without saying. Um, but they're different beasts. And so the sanctions that I'm talking about, these secondary sanctions, are the ones that are administered by Treasury. Um, and so these are found in our regulations as well. They're called the Iranian Financial Sanctions Regulations. And again, they typically involve non-U.S. persons who are not otherwise subject to primary sanctions. That's what the ITSER refers to. Uh, so again, this is the, 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 the British insurer, the Japanese car maker, the, the Mongolian um, uh, shepherd. <laughs> name, name your non-U.S. Uh, non entity. Um, and again, it, and it, the transactions are the, are the particular transaction that David mentioned. It's, it's certain actors. Um, so in other words, it's not every actor will get these consequences. Iranian SDNs, those Iranians who happen to be on our specially designated national list, um, the Central Bank of Iran, uh, those who we have identified as being materially supportive of Iran, or perhaps more complicatedly, uh, more complicatedly um, relating to certain goods, oil or gold. So in other words, an entity that's engaged in um, uh, transacting in Iranian oil or gold uh, could find themselves um, on the secondary sanctions uh, bad list or certain sectors, auto, energy, and, and shipping. And again, the main consequence here uh, is for a foreign financial institution, because that's what our sanctions focus on, these banks. As you can imagine, Treasury focus on, on the bank side of the house, um, is losing correspondent account access to U.S. banks. And again, th that's, that's where that choice comes in, because the ability to, the, the access to U.S. banks is not, as, again, I'm sure many of the people on this call are well aware, that access is not just a, a convenience for, for banks or for international traders. Um, the vast majority of international trade, the vast majority of international commerce, uh, international commercial documents even, are done with U the U.S. dollar as being the, the medium of exchange. And that means, as a practical matter, the vast majority of transactions, even between two third countries, uh, that are done in U.S. dollars actually have to transit uh, the U.S. And once they transit the U.S., uh, we have jurisdiction and our sanctions apply. And that's why this consequence for, 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 for banks can be so significant. I was in, in the Persian Gulf about two, three years ago talking to a bank about this, and uh, I explained the consequence of this, this bank, this mid-sized bank in this, in this country, losing access to their correspondent accounts uh, in New York. And the CEO looked at me and he said, well, what that, we can't do that. We would, we would just become a piggy bank then, uh, which, of course, is not, uh, not what they wanted to be. They wanted to be involved in international trade, and this is what, uh, what limited their ability to do so. So moving on. So as you, again, as you know, there is what the, currently in place, there's something called the Joint Plan of Action. And that is associated with the negotiations that are ongoing in Europe. It, it, there was a round that just ended on Tuesday um, in Geneva, I believe, this time. Um, negotiations with the Iranians as part of that negotiation. What we have decided to do, again, along with our allies, is provide limited, temporary, and reversible sanctions relief um, that's in effect now through June 30th, 2018. It's pretty important to remember that, that, that those adjectives are not just um, talking points uh, in order to curry favor with anybody. They are the reality. The, the sanctions that are in place uh, are significant, um, and they remain in place. The sanctions relief that we're providing are important. Don't get me wrong. They're certainly and meaningful, um, but they are limited, uh, certainly comparatively so, and temporary, as we said, only in place till June 30th, and eminently reversible. Uh, so that, 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 that's a very important part of the, the joint plan of action. So the relief focuses, again, only on a few specific areas of trade. This was negotiated with the Iranians. Uh, the, their petrochemical sector, gold and precious metals, inputs into Iran's autos, and then Iran's crude oil exports in specific ways. Um, civil aviation uh, has provided, we've provided sort of a statement of licensing policy, a bit more forward-leaning, allowing U.S. companies and others to engage with the Iranian, uh, some Iranian air carriers for air safety reasons and otherwise, and then uh, repatriating some restricted funds uh, abroad. Some Iranian funds have been essentially trapped abroad because banks have been very concerned about losing their access to the U.S. market. So they haven't been willing to touch Iranian money that essentially keeps piling up uh, in, in different uh, financial centers around the world. And so allowed them now to remove some of those restrictions, some of those concerns about losing their access to the U.S. market if they were to touch Iranian uh, funds. Um, and so 
part of the, the JPO as well. And then there's a human, humanitarian financial mechanism, which is a, a little more obscure, but, but certainly uh, an important component where we're, we're making it hopefully even easier uh, to allow transactions, which frankly we already allowed uh, in the humanitarian field, broadly allowed. Uh, so we're hopefully make, we're making that even, even easier. And apologies, it seems to be taking a, a while to, to load. And then the, this is an important sort of codicil again about the JPOA, is that none of the U.S. trade sanctions that prohibit U.S. companies that include themselves from engaging in trade with Iran have been altered, other than in this statement of licensing policy related to civil aviation safety. That includes the big you know, aerospace and, uh, and related companies. All of those prohibitions um, remain. So a little bit like the Cuba context, right? The sanctions themselves, there are some important you know, differences on the, on, the, on the margins here about what we're we're not allowing, but as a generalized matter, um, the sanctions by and large, disproportionately by and large, remain very much in place, very much enforced, um, and are to be strengthened, to be perfectly honest, uh, even during the context of, of, the, of the JPOA by, by listing more people who are engaged in bad activities and, and just making sure that people are aware of the risks associated with, um, with, with doing any sort of business or trade uh, with Iran. David, I, I was going to go on. I mean, there's Russia. Do you have anything to say? Uh, Iran side before I no no I don't think so I think we need to, uh, to to need turn to on, on turn the page yep okay so Russia is the uh, we, we're doing a lot of threes here all these trilogies and so this is the uh, the third third and last uh, country we're going to go into you know broad, broad detail with uh, about Russia and as as you all know the Russian sanctions are in place um, because of President Putin's behavior in the Ukraine initially uh, it was his uh, incursion um, into Crimea and then the purported announcement last spring and then of course since then the continued violence which we've seen even just this weekend uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, in the in the, what we call the Donbass Donetsk the area in the far east of Ukraine bordering um, bordering Russia <coughs> pardon me so the Russia say sectoral sanctions I mean even though they may look uh, to the untrained eye or frankly even the trained eye as very similar to the Iranian sanctions or Cuba or Burma or what have you um, you need to think about them as a practitioner or someone who is wants to comply with them through the lens of the foreign policy goals at play here which as you can imagine are very different uh, in Russia than they were in Iran or than they've been in Cuba or what have you so that's an important sort of distinction to um, uh, that, that you should be aware of. So again, Russia's sectoral sanctions are sectoral, um, but again, they're additive, as, as we'll make clear. There are primary components, secondary components, and sectoral components that are, that are pretty important. David, do you want to go through the, the sectoral, I, these yeah, essentials? I, I, would, I would just say that they're, they're cumulative. They're the primary, secondary, and there's this new category of uh, sectoral, but it's because of the complexity and the sophistication of dealing with Russia, so there's been all of these uh, tools now have come together and have been applied to, to the Russian context. And cumulatively, the, uh, uh, they essentially provide uh, a pretty strong uh, set of prohibitions. The primary sanctions apply to U.S. persons. There are some secondary sanctions in some contexts. And then there's this new category of sectoral uh, sanctions, which is, is essentially just a two-step process of identifying a sector of the economy that is problematic from the U.S. foreign policy standpoint. And then within that sector, allowing the discretion of the Secretary of Treasury to identify individual entities and persons who are to be targeted for essentially prohibition on any type of transactions by U.S. persons. And that's the essence of the sectoral sanctions. Right. And so the the subject persons, the transactions, and the targets are sort of, it's very much what, what, what David just said. I mean, it's a very, you know, in as much as primary sanctions, again, you can think of it as sort of a concentric circles, you know, are probably going the other way. Primary sanctions are incredibly broad in the, in the way they've been structured on the regime basis for Cuba or Iran, for that matter. Secondary sanctions are narrower, uh, and arguably sectoral sanctions are even narrower still. They're narrower 
both in who's being targeted and then what, what is being targeted. Many p folks who I've spoken to about the Russia sanctions basically tell me that what sectoral sanctions have done is moved uh, compliance from a question of entity to a question of activity. And so it's no longer entities that are identified on what we call the sectoral sanction identification list. They are not blacklisted in the same way that entities on our SDN list are. Rather, if you find one of those in a transaction stream and you're a U.S. person concerned about maintaining compliance with sanctions, the answer is not necessarily to stop the transaction and deny it. The answer is rather to look under it and make sure that the activity underlying the transaction is not one of the prohibited activities. That, as you can imagine, is a significant uh, headache, uh, to be perfectly frank, and very, very complicated from a technical implementation perspective, especially when we're dealing with huge volumes here. That's the other thing to just remember before we talk a little more about Russia is that the Russian economy uh, is immense. Uh, it is, the, depending how you measure, the, the 10th or 11th largest economy in the world. Um, and the reason that's important is that it is, is when you're thinking about our sanctions tools, it is the largest economy by a huge measure that any other sanctioned economy we've ever sanctioned ever. In fact, depending how you measure it, it is arguably twice the combined sizes of all other econ uh, economies we've ever sanctioned, certainly on such a broad basis. I mean, the largest one, it's a $3 trillion economy. After Russia, it's, it's Iran. That's the largest economy we've sanctioned. That's a three, four hundred billion, depending how you count on it. And then after that, most of the countries we've sanctioned have been smaller and smaller still. that aren't real economies in some senses, certainly not even regional economic powers. You know, Cuba, some, some countries in, in, in Africa, uh, North Korea, Burma, these are very small players uh, in comparison. I mean, the Cuban economy, just to give you a sense, uh, is, is about the same size as the economy of West Virginia on a GDP basis. Uh, and so you're dealing with much smaller, uh, smaller stakes in some senses. And the other thing which is important to remember about about Russia, not only is it large and therefore interrelated to countries that we care a lot about, Europe and even us, um, but since 1989 and the fall of the, of the, of the Cold War, of the, of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, one of the primary goals of our sort of economic system has been to bring them closer and closer in uh, to, the, to the Western economic system. And so the result is that there are significant interrelationships, important ones, um, between U.S. firms, European firms, and other Western country firms, uh, and people for that matter, and Russia, such that if we were to sort of impose a blanket prohibition of various sorts on the Russian economy or on even large Russian banks or otherwise, the, uh, the impact on us directly, uh, and certainly on, on, our, on our allies in Europe and otherwise, would be significant and perhaps counterproductive. Uh, and so we had to be very, very careful uh, in, in crafting these sanctions. And as you'll see, I'll go into a great, slightly greater detail as to how we did them. You'll see that we very fine slices about who it is we've targeted and what exactly it is that we've targeted and how it is we've targeted. It's a very different model, uh, much more uh, surgical model than the model we've, we've had in the past. Yeah, I think we've, we've touched upon the fact that the uh, sectoral sanctions are additive, there's a two-tier process, and that essentially um, uh, they're uh, very discreet. So, right, exactly. Uh, you can walk us through it, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, Adam, the, the, the layers, the primary, the secondary, and the sectoral of what's at play in Russia. Absolutely. So the primary sanctions are in play. There are three executive orders that are primary in nature. In other words, these are, these are I would argue, the old-fashioned kind of sanctions that we have, uh, where people end up on the SDN list. Right? So we've got three of them. We've got one that is, uh, we, we have very creative names for executive orders. We just go by number. <laughs> we don't have anything. Congress has a fun, a fun time naming, naming bills. We just, name our, we just number our executive orders. So 13660 focuses on those entities that are undermining Ukraine's territorial integrity, democracy, sovereignty. It doesn't mean everyone who's doing that and found to be doing that is sanctioned. Of course not. It means that this provides the authority for the president to identify these individuals or entities and to sanction them. The second one focuses more broadly on Russia and those entities in Russia primarily providing support to the Kremlin's Ukraine efforts. Um, so this has allowed us the authority under the executive order to sanction any member of the Russian government, uh, from the low, low list of, uh, of uh, functionaries all the way up to President Putin. That doesn't mean every member, of course, has been sanctioned. It's important to remember that the ability to sanction does not, uh, is not necessarily commensurate with having been sanctioned, uh, but it does provide the authority for us to do so. And as I'll show you in the next slide, many government officials have been sanctioned for their direct involvement in the Crimea pro problem uh, and Eastern Ukraine, for that matter.
And then more recently, we have a, a direct sanction on Crimea and Crimean issues, uh, so limiting U.S. dealings and authorizing sanctions on entities that are operating in Crimea, with the goal being we don't want Russia to benefit from their illegal uh, annexation, purported annexation, rather, of, of the region. So we have sanctioned um, this is broad little picture of about 100 plus entities, I think it's 120 now, of entities uh, under these primary sanctions. These entities appear on our SDN list, are blacklisted from a U.S. perspective. So a lot of these are companies up top, uh, some banks, some defense firms, um, and then below are some of the individuals, some very senior uh, Ukrainian individuals associated with the former regime um, of uh, President Yanukovych, some senior Russian government officials, as I mentioned, and then some, perhaps most controversially, some, uh, some what we call cronies, some members of the oligarchs, the very, very wealthy business people that are associated with basically providing uh, President Putin the means uh, um, and in some cases the will to sort of continue engaging in this, in, these sorts of behavior, in this sort of behavior. So those are the easy ones. Those are the primary sanctions. The secondary sanctions have been recently passed. Um, they are incorporated in the Ukraine Freedom Support Act of 2014. Importantly, these secondary sanctions are all discretionary, and the President has made it very, very clear that even though there's now the authority to sanction those on a secondary basis who are engaged in transactions in certain energy, financial, and defense-related uh, transactions in a similar fashion as we've done in Iran, that he has not done so, uh, and he does not plan to do so. Uh, he, his strategy still is to maintain consistency with the Europeans and make sure that what we're doing on sanctions is the Europeans are matching and vice versa. And this is a, a step too far for the Europeans at this stage. So even though this is certainly law and it provides us this authority, unlike in the Iran context, uh, it has not been um, applied in that no one has been named in such a fashion. Again, yet, yeah, that, that's the current policy. Again, we've been there before. So we've done primary and secondary. These should all be sort of very familiar now. Um, now we get to more complicated. These are the sectoral sanctions, and these all come from this third Ukraine executive order, um, which we call, again, 13662. The highlighted um, text here is the, um, is, the, is the preamble to the executive order, and it provides the sense, basically the rationale for the executive order. Uh, so this is post-Crimea annexation. It basically is talking about uh, Russian bad behavior. And it says that any entity uh, found to operate in the Rus any sector of the Russian economy as identified by the Secretary of the Treasury. So not identifying any sector, um, they, can, they can lose, they can, they can, they can uh, be sanctioned, and, or any entity that's owned by them. And the sectors we chose, apologies, the energy one is not coming up for some reason, um, it, are finance, energy, and defense. Now, those are the three sectors of the economy that we decided to focus most on. It's not rocket science what we did. These are the three economies that really provide, or the three sectors that provide the economy, um, that, that sort of buttress the Russian economy. But because of the reasons I mentioned, we did not want to go in and basically, basically list the entire sector and make it, make it off limits to everybody. Uh, rather, we decided a new type of sanction. I'm going to go through this very, very quickly, but we can talk about this. And certainly, if you go to our website, you can hear more about this, because I see the time is, is ticking here. Um, we, what we did is we applied what we call directives. And these directives are very, very limited secondary sanction, sorry, sectoral sanctions. In other words, we identified these sectors. In this case, Directive 1, we looked at banks. We said, again, this is the financial sector. And instead of making them entirely off limits to the U.S. persons, or any other person for that matter, we decided to limit their ability to engage in, uh, engage the U.S. financial markets in, in, um, uh, in obtaining new debt or uh, listing new equity. The idea here, of course, one of the goals, of course, was not to kill off these banks, right? That's not the goal of this exercise. It is to pressure them. It is to make them wonder whether or not their mid- to long-term uh, operations, obligations, and um, prospects are being served by President Putin's behavior. And so that's, that's what we've done. And these are the banks. We did it in three different tranches. These are the largest banks uh, in Russia. And so these banks are not blacklisted. U.S. persons can still hold accounts, can still engage in transactions uh, with any of these institutions other than those institutions that want to, want to approach U.S. persons uh, in the United States or abroad to engage in either raising new debt or issuing new equity. That's the only limitation that we've, we've imposed. And that model we, we imposed similarly in Directive, in directive 2, um, which is about the energy companies. Um, and again, the issue here was a new long-term debt we decided that we Again, we're not listing these entities. They're not SDNs, but rather they're no longer allowed to come to the U.S. to raise long-term debt. These are, again, some of the largest energy firms. Not trying to kill them off, trying to make it very difficult for them to engage. Directive 4 um, was one 
that we uh, we sort of increased our, the pressure on the energy firms by looking not just at their ability to raise funds, but also at their next generation uh, energy projects. And we decided that their next generation projects for oil and gas firms in Russia are primarily in sort of the, the new frontiers, so Arctic, offshore, and shale. And what, so what we've decided to do on this directive is, again, not sanction these firms, but limit the ability for U.S. persons to provide any services um, or technology to any of these firms engaged in specific sort of these new frontier projects. Okay. Uh, so, David, uh, uh, should we uh, you uh, want to try and abbreviate the enforcement uh, discussion yeah. and... Uh, and try and uh, and get the questions. I think we can do that. Uh, okay. Um, so let me let me try and give maybe a three to five minute overview of the enforcement, so we can get the questions. Uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, say that the enforcement discussion here is primary sanctions that are uh, traditionally that which have been applied to U.S. persons, and not anything in the vein of the secondary uh, sanctions. So. Um, the enforcement process at OFAC is based on enforcement guidelines that were constructed in 2009 that set out a procedure for the agency to follow in enforcing the sanctions that are under its jurisdiction. It applies to all programs and applies to the U.S. persons of primary sanctions. The goals of the enforcement process in the guidelines are to give flexibility in the agency to uh, deal with particular facts in different ways and to give the those subject to the uh, guidelines uh, predictability in what's going to be the consequences of their con uh, conduct. What can trigger an OFAC investigation? Um, reports of uh, uh, a blocked property by banks, voluntary disclosures, there's an obligation to disclose any violation. Any of the investigations may uncover another matter or another entity. There may be um, referrals from other agencies. There's publicly available information, learning about people traveling to Cuba, for example, or um, informants that may be just volunteering information to the agency. In the enforcement process, it's basically two parts. What are the tools? What are the um, uh, uh, responses that the agency can make to a given transaction that may be a violation. And here's an, here is the uh, listing of those responses from no action at the lower level of uh, the enforcement response to a criminal referral. And the most popular or the most frequent is the cautionary letter explaining that there may be a problem but uh, not taking any uh, formal uh, action, and then a civil penalty, which is the most uh, uh, notorious and what people uh, know about. And in determining which of those factors to apply in a given context, the agency has published essentially factors that it will consider. The, um, the, the, the highest and uh, most important uh, factor is, was the conduct willful or reckless on the part of the individual? Was it, were they aware of the conduct when they were engaging in it, or is it just something that happened in the course of their business? And how much harm, what was the amount that was involved, and what did it do to the goals of the sanctions uh, program? Individual characteristics, are, are they a large, sophisticated business entity or just a relatively uh, small regional uh, player that got caught in a transaction? What type of a compliance program did they have? What was the response when they found out about the, uh, uh, the violation? Did they cooperate with OFAC? And when did this occur? How did it uh, occur? And what other types of actions might be involved in the type of activity that was involved? And what will be the agency's uh, um, consequences of the agency action? Will it, if it takes a civil penalty, will it defer others, or will it not have much uh, uh, impact? In looking at the amount of a civil penalty, it's a function of two essential uh, ingredients, the egregiousness of the conduct, and the voluntariness of the uh, disclosure, or how did it come about? And essentially, the uh, value of the transaction of, of the penalty is a is a function of those two criteria. To the extent there's disclosure, there's a lesser uh, penalty, and to the extent there's uh, uh, is not egregious, it's less. And the opposite, if if it wasn't disclosed and if it was egregious. The means of calculating the base penalty is uh, based on those uh, two criteria, and then that can be adjusted depending on the circumstances. Was it a first uh, violation? Was there substantial cooperation? And there's a considerable discretion on the agency's part 
to adjust the amount of the penalty. Um, the best uh, example to give on how the matrix works is to take a hypothetical, and if we would take a $10,000 transaction as an example and work it through that matrix to determine just how much would the penalty be if the value of the transaction was $10,000. And this kind of illustrates the, the matrix is, was it self-disclosed? Um, and, and was it egregious? If it was self-disclosed and it was not egregious, a 10,000 transaction would be a 5,000 penalty. However, if it was not self-disclosed and it was egregious, it would be the base penalty of 250,000. So for a $10,000 transaction, depending on the circumstances of its egregiousness and its voluntary, it can have a wide range of difference for the civil penalty. And just to give you some context, the maximum penalties vary by program. The IEPA-based programs, which are a majority of the primary sanctions, are 250000 per transaction. And uh, the uh, Trading with the Enemy Act, TWIA, which is, which is Cuba, is 65000 uh, per violation. And we do have other programs that do have violations, and the one I, I've worked with is the Kingpin Drug is a million-dollar uh, uh, transaction. And Here's a listing of the uh, major uh, uh, cumulative penalty actions by sector over the last uh, uh, six years, and by far the largest and the most uh, 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 the, the most amounts of penalties have have involved the banking sector. And uh, in each of the years, you can see where there's red; it's over over thirty million dollars uh, 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 penalties and considerably less for other sectors like insurance, uh, credit unions, securities, and the uh, exchange houses. And I think that's uh, as quick of a summary of the enforcement process as we can give, and I think uh, it would be good now to, to turn to some questions. I mean, one thing on the enforcement before we go to the questions is that it's important to recognize that in all of those cases, or almost all of them, OFAC and Treasury is only one of several actors involved in the enforcement process. Uh, very often, even if you don't get to a criminal referral, you have all sorts of other actors, uh, both regulators um, and prosecutors, that become involved that, that also impose penalties themselves. And so, for instance, a very large penalty you might have heard about recently uh, against the French bank for about almost $9 billion. That was not a Treasury penalty only. Uh, it was Treasury in co conjunction with, uh, with other federal um, authorities and even some state authorities imposing that, that, uh, that, that fine for violations of sanctions. So that's a something to remember is that there are other actors uh, in the enforcement game other than Treasury. Thank you all and have a great day.